Good morning. My name is Seth, and I'm an anchor here at OCC, and I serve on the worship team. Uh, please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Today we're reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 16. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people, the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone and their efforts to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. All right, grace and peace to you, Ocean City people. I did this joke in the first service, so I hope you laugh. So the pastors here have a uniform, flannel shirt, thin, thin jeans, and surf shoes. We did not plan this. It's just what middle-aged dads that surf want to look like. And, you know, I'm trying to fit in. We got all these cool guys up here um, with, you know, guitars and hats. I'm just trying to, you know, not embarrass my children, which I continually do on a daily basis is embarrass uh, my kids. Um, if, you, if you haven't been with us y and you don't know who I am, I am, I'm Dave. I'm one of the pastors. And if you do know how, who I am, I tend to burn hot. You know, I get like excited. I'm trying to think of verbiage that doesn't just say, I'm excited. I'm passionate. I'm like, what else can I say uh, about how I'm feeling? <laughs> um, here's the thing. This season that we're in, this, this series that we're in, I, I feel very hopeful um, because in our small groups, what we call city groups, and here on Sundays, we're all together digging into the Bible. You know, it's verse by verse. We're going through uh, Thessalonians right now, and it just makes me feel like I just got this sense that, like, unity is, is building, uh, which also sounds kind of Christian-y, but it's something that we need. We need to come together, uh, those of us that call our, ourselves believers uh, uh, in Jesus. Um, oh, I wanted to, how awesome was worship this morning? Um, <laughs> It was kind of dangerous to put me up here with Abby and Emily. That's a lot of emotion coming at you, you know, on a Sunday morning. But we held it together, you know. There wasn't that much tears or uh, uh, screaming, but I'll, I may do that in a little bit. We'll see what happens. Um, but, yeah, last week, uh, Derek, Derek, sometimes he just, he's just masterful, masterful in the way that he breaks down things and teaches us as our lead pastor. But if you missed last week... It's awesome. You got to go back and listen to it. We're trying to get that up online uh, on Mondays. We used to do it on Tuesdays, but we're trying to get it up on Mondays because we're going through these, uh, these series together in our small groups. But he was talking about how we have like a, a, a branding problem, like the way the world sees us, us Christian people, call ourselves Christian, is not great. Like it's a tough time in our day and age to be called a Christian. Right, like the standard for morality just keeps on bouncing, and if we as Christians say anything about where the line should be, I don't know God's law. I mean, people come down on us hard. Per per persecution is a real thing. It used to be something you just hear about in other countries. You know, like growing up as a young Christian, they would talk about people in other countries, in, in Africa, and other remote places. They're suffering persecutions because they have faith. Well, now 
in our day and age, in our country, we're starting to see that it is not easy and people don't perceive the church well. So he was, it was great. He was talking about how we have to go back to the old ways, the ways that Paul writes in these first few chapters and, and, and rebrand and live and, and present ourselves with boldness and, and, and gentleness and faithfulness. It was awesome. I, you got to go back and listen to it. Um, but my favorite part, I told him this earlier uh, was when he was talking about how Paul told them, look, I didn't come here as a salesman. I'm not a religious salesman. I'm not trying to like tick the box off and well, this many people get saved and now I'm going to move on and start another church so I feel good about myself. He talked about how he, he loved them and he got to know them and he became like family with them, which is, was my favorite part because uh, that's what we should do right, but it's also the hardest part because it's hard to make relationships, isn't it? Like you, sharing your life with people is not easy. Uh, you know, and you, it's, hard, you know, it's hard enough to say that you should do it, but within the context of us as a, a group of people that come here to 6th Avenue North pretty regular, uh, it's not easy. It's, you know, we get our feelings hurt. Sometimes we feel, you know, on the outside trying to get on the inside. You know, all kinds of things. It's, it's just tricky. But he was right, man. He was right. That's the way we need to, to kind of move together. And you see that language in these books. You see the language of family. Did you see how Seth was reading? It starts out brothers and sisters. And the first, and Derek talked about this last week, mother. We were like mothers to you. We are brothers. We're sisters. You're the children. You're the family of God. We're fathers. The language. He has this family language that I love because I think uh, he's making a big, a pretty, a, a big point for us to try to imitate families, good, healthy families, good dads, good moms, good brothers, good sisters, Good, good uh, loving each other, encouraging each other. And he uses the word imitate, imitate me a bunch. Derek talked about it um, last week, or the, two weeks ago in chapter 1. If you look with me in uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, um, verse 6, it says, You became imitators of us in the Lord, and we welcomed the message, uh, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And you'll see this all through Paul's writings, 1 Corinthians 11, Imitate me just as I imitate Christ. 1 Corinthians 4, 16. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. And Philippians, join one another in following my example, brothers. Carefully obs to observe those who walk according to the pattern that we set for you. So you'll notice I've used a bunch of different uh, uh, translations. Typically, on a Sunday, we will stick to ESV just for continuity. But today is about uh, the Bible. It's about being brothers and sisters and family. And I really want to make a point about how important it is to uh, become passionate about Scripture. That's, kinda, that's what's driving uh, the, the elders and the pastors and the leadership here is we want to come together and be, be people uh, that know, actually know the Bible, that seek the Bible on our own. We don't just get it fed uh, by somebody else. But you see that language of imitate me, follow me, all throughout his brothers, act like me, remember your family. Remember you're adopted now. If you call yourself a Christian in this room, we are family in God's kingdom, in God's house. We are connected. Remember, act, imitate, do like I did, share your life together. All the good stuff you're supposed to say, right? Um, but... It made me think about family and the, just the sacredness of what it's like to be a, fa a family, like mothers, dads. Uh, there's nothing, probably nothing more sacred, more sacred relationship on planet Earth than like the mother to the, to the child relationship. It's, it's, it's special. It's hard to describe. It's probably one of the most special things that we get to experience, especially if you uh, are fortunate enough to have a good one. Um, I remember Sarah and I were 22-year-olds when we had our first uh, baby Asher, he's 21 now, and we it was a, he was six months old. It was first time we were ever going to leave him. I mean, we were just kids ourselves. I didn't think I, I was a kid at the time. Looking at it now, I'm like, oh my god, Asher could have a baby in one year. No, not ready. Only been paying rent for like three months. Can't do that. Um, but yeah, that was I was him, a little bit older, and I have a baby, and he was so fun. You know, like my little buddy. Uh, so exciting, but. We left him for the first time with Sarah's mom. She had a crib at the house, everything, and we left the country. We were gone for a week, and we came back all excited, like, oh, we're going to see her. I'm like, yeah, I get to see my little buddy, my chubby little blonde baby. It was so cool. Uh, but it was different for Sarah. Like, she was just could not wait to get to that, to that crib. So we go in the house, and we open the door, and, like, there he is. He's sleeping, and I'm so, like, oh, there he is. But Sarah was like... It was like this energy, like, whoa, like just flowing off. Like she saw the baby, and she took this huge breath, and it just like sucked all the, the, uh, the air out of the room. I was like, whoa. 
think I'm going to let you go in there. I'll just stay out here and watch. This is awesome, you know. But it's just, it was just, it was beautiful. I'll never forget it. And then I have four kids, my adopted son, Kennedy. Today's is actual what they call a gotcha day. Literally 11 years ago, we were in Uganda uh, and uh, getting this little boy named Kennedy. And he was just a little guy, and Sarah was going to be his second mom. Like, he lost his first one, right? And now he's getting a new one. And, like, we didn't even know him, really. And within, I'd say, 3.1 3.1 seconds that he knew that that was, he was like, you're my mom, and that guy I don't trust, but you, we are, I love you, mom, and you stay away from her. This is my mom. Just, we butted heads immediately, you know, like, wait a second, man, I'm the dad here, you don't, and he just, I mean, he loved her. I swear to you, it was crazy. We were 30 at the time, I think. Eh, maybe a little older than that. Anyway, so the first night we stayed with this kid speaks no English at all. I speak no Lugandan. I go into the bathroom to do what you do in there. When I come out, this little dude, we were sharing one tiny bed in this little rundown uh, hotel. He has taken some blankets, no pillow, and made a bed on the floor for me. <laughs> he pointed to it like you, sleeping with mom. Me, you, you get down there, and I was like, no. Wait, I can't tell you to get down. No. I, he, he loved her. You know, like he just immediately, like there was nothing like it. And even my daughters, they're big now. They're 18, almost 18 and almost 15, Kaylee and Sadie. And they're, you know, they're, they're more like, at times they're more like my, my buddy. Like I come home and they're like, dad, they're just all, dad, you're doing such a great job working and buying things. Where's mom? And I'm like, uh, she's busy. She's got a meeting about, can I help you with anything? And they're like, <laughs> I will just wait for mom. And I'm like, well, I'm, I, I'm a fireman. I just, I'm capable of lots of things. I can fix stuff. I'm sure there's a problem you have that I might be able to help you with. And they're like, yeah, we're just going to wait for her. You know, like they just, they got to have her. They got to deal with her. It's just like, you know, what are dads good for? We're good to imitate. I want to show you a video. This is about, this is dad stuff right here. Ready? Watch this. <laughs> Again, please. Too cute. Huh? Yeah! Good. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that has nothing to do with the Bible, but it is absolutely adorable. But it actually does have to do with the Bible. It's the imitate thing. It's the, so the language is very natural to us, isn't it? We imitate our parents. We imitate our brothers and sisters. We are family. So he's using this stuff for us on purpose. So if you look at our verses today, um, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 9, I want to point some things out because this is a pretty traumatic uh, sentence. I'll show you why. Verse 9, surely you remember, brothers and sisters, remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We work night and day in order not to burden anyone. While we preach the gospel to you and you are witnesses and so is God of how holy, righteous and blameless we were among you who believed. It's just crazy language to me. I mean, the guys to me when I first read it, it's like he's saying like, I pretty much figured this out. I, we burden no one. We ask for nothing and we're perfect. I was perfect and you guys all saw it. Holy blameless and righteous and I'm thinking I thought that that's like the I thought it was we're all in sin like the wages of sin is death kind of thing Paul is Paul saying that he has figured it out like he has found a way to get himself holy and righteous and blameless and burden no one and just do everything in this Christian stuff right because if that's the standard he's saying imitate me copy me be like me if the standard is I got to be holy and blameless I'm out I'm not I I'm I'm not going to be able to attain this. I don't know how it makes you feel, but that's how I felt. I'm like, this, is that what he's saying? He's saying, remember, you can't imitate what you don't remember. And is this what he's saying to us in this passage? This is the standard. He sets himself up to us as the standard to be copied, which is crazy to me. Because if, you're, if you know anything about this guy writing this letter... His name used to be Saul, and just a little over a decade before, he was number one enemy of Jesus. Hated him. Hated him. Literally was a mass murderer going into people's homes, killing the very first Christians, destroying the brothers and sisters. And now he's writing and saying, we were, I was holy and blameless and righteous, and you guys all saw it. 
How, maybe like trying to get my mind wrapped around this whole thing. Like, what is this guy talking about? Well, I want to show you. If Whenever you come across, like I said, today's, I'll be using a bunch of different scriptures. You're going to want to write these things down. But you, when you come across a passage, and this is a Pastor, pastor Shepherd thing, you come across a passage in your own personal study of the Bible, and you find something that's difficult to interpret, you use scripture to interpret scripture. So you use other scripture to help you figure out what you're having a difficult time uh, interpreting and understanding. I'm going to show you. But before I do that, back to this guy Saul. A decade later, he's killing Christians, hates Jesus. Uh, in fact, he was present at the very first martyr ever of Christianity, a guy named Stephen. And Stephen literally lived out exactly what Derek preached last week. It's amazing. I mean, boldness, faithfulness, gentleness, everything that he was teaching us last week, Stephen did it. He stood up in boldness, but he was gentle, and he was faithful. He was telling the gospel, telling the story to his people, and they killed him for it. They threw stones, and, 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 and they killed him. It says in the story in Acts 7 that those that, that, that cast their stones at him as he was dying, they took their jackets and their cloaks off, and they laid it at the feet of a man named Saul. And this is the guy writing this letter. So look at that, Acts chapter 8, verse 1 through 3. Stephen is martyred, and it says this, very first ver verse, and Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen, and they mourned him deeply. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them into prison. Now, look at the kind of guy this person is. He wasn't just like, like us, like most of us, like I've... I've Dealing with some sin, and I, I probably, I do feel bad about it. Maybe I need to repent. No. He was adamantly set himself up as a hater. He hated. He made himself an enemy of Jesus. Jesus. Right? We're in church. We're talking about Jesus, the one on the cross, the one in the virgin birth, that guy. This guy, Saul, said, I hate him. I hate him. And I'm going to kill everybody that follows him. It's amazing. I mean, his story might be the greatest love story of the gospel there is. It might explain the theology of Scripture better than just about anything else. The only thing rivaling it might be the prodigal son story. That even when we are at the lowest, not only just in sin, but in full opposition to him, Jesus the Savior, and we, have, we, are, we, have, we hate him, he still comes from me. He still comes to us, and I'm going to show you if you haven't heard this story. Acts chapter 9. This is incredible for the, those new to the faith. You got, and if, even if you're not, it's wonderful to, to tell you about it again and get up here because it just, it just builds my faith to remember these things from Scripture. Acts chapter 9, verse 1, it says this. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of Jesus, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to, uh, to the synagogues of Damascus. So that if he found any of those who were of the way, the way of Jesus, men or women, he might bring them and bound them to Jerusalem. As he journeyed near Damascus, suddenly a light shone all around him, and he, heard a vo and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Now imagine yourself in, in Saul's uh, situation. And then the Lord said this, I am Jesus who you are persecuting, it is hard for you to kick against the pricks or goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The story goes on. Paul ends up blind. He gets taken to a specific house. He can't see for uh, several days, and his his, his, he goes on to become the greatest missionary that great, wrote two-thirds of the Bible that we call sacred scripture. This guy writes two-thirds of it. He goes from being an enemy, fully hating, not only being in sin, but hating Jesus, to having an encounter with God, like an unbelievable encounter. Full opposition, full of rage, mass murder. But the one, Jesus, like this sounds poetic, but Jesus, the one that still has holes in his hands. If you don't know the rest of the story, after Jesus rises from the dead, he, he shows himself to his 12. And Thomas, he gets to be, 
he gets the unlucky nickname of Doubting Thomas because some of the other disciples were like, Thomas, we've seen him. He's not, I know we watched him die, but he, he's, he's risen. And he's like, man, you guys are going crazy. Unless I can touch the holes in his hands, I'm not going to believe. And then Jesus shows himself in, if there physically to, to, to Thomas. And he says, Thomas, come touch the, the holes in my hands. He said, touch the, the holes in my side where they speared me. It's me. Don't doubt anymore and believe. And it's just, it just blows my mind. Like, these are the hands that create everything. God himself, who literally hangs the stars. And this, I know this is Preacher Dave, Preacher Derek type of stuff. Where we, but think about it. He made everything. The hands that hold every cell of the universe together, those hands now have holes in them. And you and I, those that profess faith, one day we'll be like Thomas and we'll see him. And we'll be like him, the Bible says, and we will see those holes that were pierced for me and for you and for the family, the children that he came to rescue and ransom and adopt into his family. This is Jesus, and this is what he's like. And how far will he go? Not only are we in sin, but if you are an enemy of God, Jesus will still come to you and say, it's hard for me to watch you kick against the pricks. Where are the pricks or the goads? So the, the Romans um, and the Greeks, they would tie up their oxen and with their carts and their leather and everything like that, and they whipped an ox. Ox don't like that, and they make them work. Well, what they cre- sometimes they would resist, and they would kick. So what they made is this pole with all these spikes all the way around it, and they would position them on a certain ways behind this ox. And if he got angry and resisted as they're whipping him, he would kick. And either he would kick it with the bottom of his foot, or as his rear would move, it would stab him in his, in his back. And the Greeks called it the ruinous resistance. Ruinous resistance. Resistance, like it's futile, like they're causing their own pain, more suffering by resisting us. And they had that for the lands that they would take over. They would tell them, it's ruinous resistance for you. We surrender now, or if your resistance will all, only cause you more pain. So here Jesus is saying that to Saul. He's saying, Saul, your unwillingness to surrender and give up control to me, Jesus, is ruining you. When we resist him, we are made to surrender. We are made to be children of God. We are made for heaven. But when we resist him, it ruins us. See, Saul learned that resistance to Jesus was a losing battle. God is sovereign. His will is absolute. He will prevail. Those of us who resist Jesus cause our own ruin, don't we? Jesus is saying, in effect, and, you, and I love that you can hear the compassion of Jesus in this phrase, like, Paul, I'm watching you kick and suck, causing your own ruin, your own pain. It's hard for me to watch. Why are you doing this? Surrender your life to me. Give your life to me. Jackie Hill pa- uh, Perry, uh, she's a famous preacher. Kaylee, my daughter, sent me one of her podcasts, and I couldn't find exactly where she said it, but she was talking about the love of God and the grace of God and how expansive and how huge it is that while we would be sinners, we would also be like Paul's enemies of Jesus and that he loves us still. And if in, true, in reality, if we were to look at it, he is the one that's primarily offended, right? Like he has every right, every right to turn his face from me, every right to judge me and cast me away, but he still comes to me. He still loves me. His blood is still full of all forgiveness that can exist for you and I. He still comes. He still says, even in my resistance, my own pain, my own arrogance, he loves me, and he comes to me, right? And I want to say this to you guys. I said it in the first gathering as well. Are you in this room and you're kicking against the pricks? Like you're in this room and you're like, I, I've been resisting the spirit of God. I have been resisting Jesus. I've been, I'm angry about things. I don't know if I believe this. I'm resisting. I'm kicking against God's will. And it's causing me pain and I didn't even know it. Are you kicking against the pricks today? Or do you have someone in your life, a loved one, and this one is personal for me. Is there somebody in your life that you love, a husband, a, a, a son, or a daughter, a parent, that, that, that is almost like this? Like, not only do they not believe, they, 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 they're, they're angry about the fact that they don't believe. And you feel like hope is lost for them. This story proves that, that their hope is not lost. That Jesus comes and he knocks 
Derek preaches this all the time. He is the hound of heaven. He took the cross and he will come after us, even those that seem like they're too far gone, that there's no hope. And I would encourage all of you, if, you're, if you've been in this room and you have someone in your life like that, that you've been praying for for a long time, keep praying and pray that God would do something like this. It seems, because Jesus is no respecter of persons, that the harder we resist, the likelihood of him coming and doing something supernatural increases. And I would encourage you to pray that way and believe and be in hope because Jesus saves. He can save and he's the only one that can do it. There's no one like Jesus. So back to where we were at. This guy writes, so he was the worst sinner of all time basically. And then he says, I'm holy, righteous, and blameless. So how does he go from being the worst to basically just sounding like he figured it all out? Again, if the standard is I got to be holy and blameless and never burden anybody, I'm, not a, I'm really in trouble. I burden people all the time. Ask her. Mostly her, really. Um, the kids kind of, but mostly Sarah. Sorry, babe. I'm working. I'm trying to be a better Christian. I'm reading this. Um, but yeah, like, I don't think I can do this. I don't know, think any of you could do this either. Again, you use scripture to interpret scripture. I'm going to show you from some of Paul's own, own writing what he's trying to communicate to the uh, Thess- Thessalonians. This is Colossians 1, 21 through 23, verse 19. You ready? This is awesome stuff. You've got to read it. And if you're a Bible nerd, write it down. If you're not a Bible nerd, you can't admit that in church, so just pretend like you're writing it down. Verse 19, for God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. You ready? This is the part. Once you were alienated from God and were what? Enemies. Enemies of Jesus in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to do what? Present you holy. Holy in whose sight? God as a witness. Holy in his God's sight without blemish. Blame. And free from accusation. It's the same verbiage. By the power of the blood of Jesus, not by any work that you could do. It is not possible for you to be holy. It is not possible for you to be free of blame and have no accusation against you. All of us have fallen short, but by the blood of Jesus, when we establish our faith in him, he presents us. And God is a witness that he's made me righteous and cleansed me of all sin. And there's no more condemnation in Jesus. Verse 23, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you have heard, the gospel that you, have, that you heard and have been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, has become a servant. You see it. He's not saying he's figured out. He's saying because of the ultimate work of the cross, Jesus Christ makes me new. It, when I put my faith in him, what is presented before God and presented for, to the world is that this is how I stand in heaven. I like it even better in Colossians. This one might even say it better. It's one of my most favorite scriptures. Colossians 3. Therefore, if you've been what? Raised with Christ. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2. Set your mind. Set your mind on things above, not things that are on the earth. For you died. You died in your sin. You died in your transgressions. You were cut off from the land of the living. You died. But with Jesus, your life is now hidden with Christ And God, when Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you will be revealed with him in glory. So a faith established and firm and held on to hope has a life, a life that is now hidden in Christ, is cleansed by the blood of Jesus, is presented to God and to the world as holy and blameless. So he's trying to say, look, he's he's passionately trying to communicate in his teaching that radical surrender Ending the, ru- the, ru- the resistance, ending the ruinous resistance and radically surrendering you to Jesus is the path, the wholeness. It is the path to freedom from sin. It is the path to everything that we think we actually want in life. This is what he was saying to them. Radically surrender. Awesome. Jesus says it better than anyone. I know i got a lot of scriptures in here, but it's Bible day. It should be every day at church. Matthew 16, 24 through 25, verse 24, Jesus' own words. And Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, 
surrender, radical surrender, and take up their cross and follow me. That's the definition of surrender, radically surrendering to Jesus. Verse 25, for, look here, for whoever wants to save their life, resisting him and try to do it my way and see if I can fix my own problems, fix my own sin, the longer that I resist him, it will ruin me, and in the end, I'll lose it all. The, I will lose it all, but look at what he says, whoever loses their life for me will find it. Radical surrender to Jesus and him only. Bowing your knee, calling him Lord, giving him your life, being honest in repentance about your struggles and your sin, establishing your faith, setting your mind, like the Bible says. All awesome stuff, right? How does this play out? How does it flesh out for us in non-super Christianese words? Well, let's keep going. We'll get there, I promise. Verse 11. So back into um, uh, Thessal Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 uh, he says this, for you know that we dealt with each of you as a father, there's that language again, deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into the kingdom, of, into his kingdom and glory. What do bold, faithful, and gentle people like Derek was teaching us last week do? They encourage, they comfort, and they urge, or they charge one another like a family does. There's nothing more encouraging than a good family. There's nowhere safe than having parents and siblings that comfort you when you need it. Where do you want to go when you need comfort? You want to go to your mom, or you want to go to your dad, or you want to be in your home with your family. This is what he's telling us to behave like. And I would say this, if you're new to Christianity and you're like, I don't know a lot about the Bible. This guy keeps yelling about the Bible. I don't really know what it looks like to be a Christian and how that, what should my first step should be. Start by living this way. Encourage people in the church. Comfort people. Give people your peace. Give people your prayers. Give people your, your love. Charge people. Love people. This is what it looks like to be a Christian. And I would say encouragement is the highest form of leadership in my opinion. I've been a fireman for almost 17 years. I've seen every style of leadership. It's very military style. The fear based gets it done, but you, you, people are not endeared to you. Encouragement is the best way. And I would say this order is the best too. This is a little sidebar. We, what do we do, Christians? What do we do, family? You, know, you probably won't admit this, but we all do this. We want to skip past the encouragement part and move past the uh, comfort part and go right into holding everybody accountable, don't we? Well, I want to charge them, that brother in Christ, you know, that's, you shouldn't be doing it. You know, hey, like we, we want to make sure everyone's living straight and narrow all the time. We're, we're being Christians. We're trying to hold them accountable. Yes, it does say that. But I think what he's trying to get us to do is, hey, you got to do all three. Spend as much time encouraging, as much time comforting, and much time holding each other together as a family as you can. And how does that look? I told you we'd flesh this out. Yeah, that sounds good. How do we do it? How is this done? Setting your mind on things above. And I want to say this. If you're a note taker, write this one down. Setting your mind, like we just read, is the movement of faith and hope in the human heart and soul. It's, it's, the, it's the turning of the eyes upwards. It's the, you're setting your minds on things above, and it's, start, it's, it's where faith is engaged with the Spirit of God. Setting your mind, what does it look like to actually set my, how do I set my heart, my soul, my mind, and faith on God? Well, awesomely, Paul describes it in verse 13. You ready? And we also thank God continually because you who have received the word of God, which you've heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work. This is very profound. Don't miss this. Which is indeed at work in you. Indeed at work. It's at work. It's at work in you who believe. This is the setting the mind. This is the established and firm. This is what it looks like when we anchor ourselves to the scriptures, to the Bible. This is what has been given to us. This is what has been revealed to us, and you're like, well, it doesn't seem fair. Why wouldn't God just talk to us audibly? Well, guess what? We don't get to make up how this goes. Most times from what I read in the Bible, when God does speak audibly, everybody lays down and wants to crawl in a hole, and they're scared to death. Look at it from the Old Testament and the New Testament. Or they end up on a mountain, and they hear him speak, and they just want to stay on top of the mountain forever and never talk to anyone else ever again. So maybe in our fallen, broken state now, before our full redemption comes, he gives us the word. So that we can anchor, that we can set, we can establish ourselves in him. Jesus himself said, heaven and earth are going to pass away. They're going to be gone. 
but what my word will live forever. It's active, it's alive, it's what gives us uh, uh, everything, it's what gives us life. Matthew, Jesus, I'll go through these quickly. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus said, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus himself, Job, potentially the oldest written book of scripture. He said this, I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. Psalm 119, I'm throwing a bunch up here. Longest chapter in the Bible. It literally over 100 verses tells you when you consume the Bible, when you anchor to it, this is what happens to a human being. Verse 103, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than the honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, your laws. Therefore, therefore I hate every wrong path. And your word is a light to my feet, a lamp to my path. It's the path. It's the life. It's what sustains us and it keeps us safe when we're rooted. It's how we set our minds. So last week, this is, this is what I want to charge to you. These are my points. If last week Derek was saying, look, the outside world, way we're presented, we have, a, we have an image problem. And we need to change that. We need to be bold, gentle, and faithful. I think here today, in these same passages, in the same chapter, Paul is telling us, we've got to do some rebanding within the four walls of the church. How are we to live with one another? How are we supposed to be brothers and sisters and family and imitate Christ like Paul is teaching? How does that look for you and I? Number one, here's my points. Remember your family. Remember that your family And what does the family do? They encourage, they comfort, and they charge. Number two, anchor yourself to the Bible. Anchor yourself personally to Scripture. Set your mind, establish, tether. Number three, surrender. Surrender, radically end the resistance to him. We're family. We've talked about that all morning. I think you've you've kind of picked up on that. We are to love each other like brothers and sisters. Anchor, last scripture, Hebrews 4.12, so cool. It says this, for the the word of God is loving and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrows, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Why? Why does God works in us this way? He is indeed in work in us. It's also a place of safety. You know, the Bible talks about the winds coming, the rains coming in Ephesians 4, and Jesus told himself, we the family, when we're anchored in him, when we're lodged into the foundation that is the word of God, when the winds of life come, and they will come, right? Things might be calm for you right now, but you know storms are coming. Things are going to be happen. Sickness might come. Injury might come. The loss of finances might come. We're always all scared of it, but when we have Jesus, when we're rooted in him, it's a place of safety. It keeps us safe, those that are anchored in uh, Jesus. Jesus even said himself, the winds will come and the rains will come. Whoever puts my words into practice is like a wise person who built his house on the rock. Last little quick thing. Um, so there's a lot. this is a surfing church, a quick surfing analogy. Uh, First started surfing at 16, moved here from, I'm a Yankee, I lived in Minnesota, and everybody surfs here, so I had to surf, right? So somebody gives me a board, no leash, it's all busted up and brown. Um, I lived in a trailer with two of my buddies, an actual trailer. Uh, it was not very nice. Uh, on Roscoe Boulevard, which was very nice. Trailer bad, Roscoe nice. Roscoe good. Well, we had this little thing in our room that people would call, and it would leave a message for you. And if you push the button, it would record it. It's called an answering machine. And I remember my buddy James, he, I, we came home, I'm working, I think I worked at Outback Steakhouse at the time, I hit the button and he says, go surfing, Dave. We ended up calling Magical Tuesday. So I didn't, I wasn't, I still knew, I'm like, where do I go? It's like, Michaelers, it's the only break I had ever been to, I'd never been anywhere. So I get my beat up board, no leash, and I'm like, I'm going. And I had done the little Jack's Beach surf thing, this was a different animal. Big hurricane swelled, I get to the beach, and it was just massive waves rolling in, beautiful, and I was scared to death. Because I was young and dumb, I'm like, I'm still going for this, though. You know, I didn't know what could happen. You know, like, I'm young, I'm invincible. I start paddling out there, and I am terrified. I'm getting just destroyed, and I'm not doing any surfing. I'm holding on to the board for dear life. Like, if I lose this thing, I'm going to drown and die. Like, I was, I'm way over my head, literally. Well, my buddy Ed, Ed Lehman, he was a good surfer. He comes paddling over. And he sees me just struggling. He goes, here, Dave. And he takes the leaf off his board. And he gives it to me. He goes, you need this. Put this on. And, and he paddled away. And here's the thing. I put that thing on. And guess what? I was still getting crushed by these waves. But I, had, I was tethered 
I actually tried to I let go of the fear. I let go of the, the, the fear of dying or drowning or being lost in the storms as they're washed of the water you know, washing over me. And I tried to start catching the waves. I was anchored to something. This is what the word of God becomes for us when we walk in this life. It becomes an anchor when things are washing over us and are hard. You know, I don't think there's a better time or better day to talk about my last point, surrender, ending the resistance than a day when we have communion, right? I mean, Jesus models for us what surrender looks like, the ultimate surrender, the ultimate sacrifice. Jesus, the one that we put our faith in, gave his life for you and I. He gave it up on the cross. Why? So we could be family so that he could bring us into his house and call me a son and call me a daughter, to call you a son or you a daughter, to make you one of his kids and bring you into his heavenly home because he loves you. And he wanted us to remember not only that we're family, but remember how much he sacrificed, how much he gave up, how much he surrendered by giving his self for the, on the cross and dying. So on his last night before his death, Jesus, he had a dinner with his brothers and sisters. And he called them his brothers and sisters. You are my brothers and my sisters. Because I want you to remember. I want you to remember how much I love you. I want you to remember how far I'm willing to go. That while you were in sin, while you were enemies of me, I still gave my life. And I will come again. But until I do, I want you to do this and make it sacred. Make it sacred, as, as family does. Break bread together and remember my sacrifice. So he took the bread, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. I'm going to break it. No one takes my life, but I'm going to lay it down because I love you. When you do this, remember me. Remember me. And then he raised the cup, and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pour out my blood. I'm going to let it out. It's, this blood is being shed for many, for the remission of sins, for the redemption of my sons, for the redemption of my daughters. Whenever you drink this, do this, and remember me. Remember that I'm going to come back for you. It's all right, guys. It's just a sacred moment. Don't worry about it. <laughs> all right, back to sacred. Sorry. Can't always make jokes. These pastors, jeez. I've mentioned the word sacred. This is a family moment. If you're in this room and you're not a Christian, you haven't put professed faith in Jesus, do not feel obligated to come and partake this, this bread and this wine. This is for the family of God. He said, come together, remember. And he told, and the Apostle Paul teaches, when you do this, make it sacred. I want you to examine your life. Take a few minutes and think about your heart. Think about your sins. Think about your struggles. Examine the way that you've lived. And, and, and make it holy come up here and remember that i'm the only thing that can wash those sins i'm the only path to life jesus there is no other way remember my sacrifice so i'm going to ask my uh my uh servers to come get into place and i'm going to pray so i just want to encourage you as they're coming and i pray just take take 10 seconds 15 seconds and, and pray with me and, and examine where you are examine your life and 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 just make this a moment that's special as we remember God. Lord, we love you, Jesus. God, we resist you so often, Lord, and, and we just want to confess to you our sins now, God, that you, we ask for your forgiveness. We ask that you wash us. We know that you're the only path to life, and we want to remember that, Jesus, you save. You're the only thing that's, that saves, and you told us to do this to remember your sacrifice, God. As a church together this morning, we remember how much you gave for us. God, and we look forward to the day that you will be revealed in your kingdom and your glory and we'll see you and we'll be like you like scripture says and we'll see those holes in those hands that were, that were pierced for all of us. We love you, Jesus. Come and be with, with us this morning. In your name we pray.